Hi, I'm Dr. Arnold David Hausman, and you've discovered Vital Signs, a public service TV show sponsored by Phelps Memorial Hospital that investigates medical topics in the news. With us today, I have Dr. Mark Hammett. Uh, Dr. Hammett is the Director of Interventional Radiology, covering numerous hospitals, uh, especially Phelps. And radi uh, interventional radiology is one of the, uh, probably one of the most rapidly growing and certainly one of the most important uh, minimally invasive procedure uh, oriented uh, specialties uh, currently available and uh, happily we have Mark with us today he's going to tell us everything that we need to know to take the most advantage that you can of this wonderful modality. Uh, Dr. Hammett do me a favor tell us exactly what is interventional radiology. Well interventional radiology is when you use radiology imaging to do essentially minimally invasive procedures on patients. By minimally invasive what do you mean? Um, the idea is to uh, have more procedures done as outpatient procedures to decrease hospital stay, uh, to make the procedures shorter, less painful, um, but at the same time making them more effective. The whole ultimate goal is to improve people's quality of life. So you're able to do things through punctures as opposed to through incisions. Exactly. Everything we do starts off with a needle. Typically it ends with nothing more than a Band-Aid. And again, these are outpatient procedures, things you can do uh, uh, in and out same day of the procedure? The majority of the procedures are, yes. What would you say that you do as a, you know, the majority of cases that you do uh, in terms of uh, procedures? What kind of procedures will the interventional radiologist uh, offer? Well, uh, some of the more basic things that we do are uh, drainage procedures where uh, we're basically getting fluid out of places where it's accumulated abnormally. For example? Such as in the chest, in the abdomen. Uh, sometimes there's blockages within systems such as in the kidneys, in the, in the liver. Um, and we can get that fluid out if it uh, shouldn't be there. People develop infections inside called abscesses and we can drain them. Um, so instead of needing a large incision to drain you know, a collection of purulent material as you see in an abscess, you can just do it percutaneously, meaning through the skin, introduce a needle and then, then what? Well, it depends on the size of it. It depends on what we're looking for. Sometimes we can just drain out the fluid, um, but sometimes we'll actually leave a tube behind um, so that the fluid can drain out over a longer period of time. And that can often, you know, keep people from having to actually undergo a, a, an operation. Um, people get uh, appendicitis and they develop an abscess next to the appendix. Instead of having an emergency operation, which has its own set of issues, we can drain the abscess, allow the patient to actually heal and get better, um, and have the operation at their leisure. Now, we've seen that, you know, from personal experience. I can, you know, attest to the fact that you We've taken things like uh, uh, major abscesses in the kidneys, for example, that can now be drained percutaneously without requiring a major operation. So mm -hmm. that's, that's amazing. So you say, so drainage is one of the, the major uh, interventions that you do. What would you say the other, you know, top two or three? Um, that? The next one that we probably do most often would be uh, in the line of venous access, where people need IV antibiotics or other IV medications for various reasons. And uh, we have different ways of getting into, uh, depending on how long they're going to need the access and if they're going to need it at home or if they're going to be staying in the hospital the entire time. So, for example, for long-term antibiotics, say for Lyme disease or for uh, chemotherapy, uh, One access where you're not, you're not going to be, you're not going to want to keep sticking somebody every day or multiple times. Exactly. Uh, well, for chemotherapy, we tend to um, put in what's called a porticath, um, and it's a it's a little tiny like bubble that actually sits underneath the skin surface and it has a tube that communicates with the veins under, uh, under the skin. Um, so you don't see anything visibly except a small bump. So when the patient comes in for infusion therapy, uh, someone will actually access it going through the skin. It's still a needle that goes through the skin, but they have a target, um, which is this port. Um, and people that have, say, Lyme disease, we have a couple of options. Um, one that's very popular right now is something called a pick line which is a tube that actually goes into the arm um, and uh, it uh, can stay in for usually up to about a month or so. And so. So our venous access, I mean, people mostly familiar with the standard IV like you see on the TV shows, uh, <coughs> that's an access that doesn't stay in very long. No. A couple of days before you have to change it. Right. Those usually don't stay in very long. We, have, we put in one catheter called a Hickman catheter. Um, that's really designed for people who are going to need access for more than, uh, say, three weeks. That comes out of the chest wall here, which allows people to have full use of their arms. Does it go into the chest? It actually goes under the skin here, tunnels underneath the skin, and enters the vein here. And I had one patient that had one of those in for 15 years um, oh. with no problem at all. 
How come they didn't get a Hickman cat? I mean, a uh, one of those subcutaneous catheters. Uh, this one was just easier because they took care of themselves. It was okay. for uh, chronic nutrition, and they were able to take care of it themselves at home. And you don't have to change it. You can use the same tube. You have to change it periodically. Uh, we actually, the, the, it would stayed in for 15 years, and we changed it for the first time after 15 years. Wow. So I would say that's atypical, though. That normally, is that what you do? You keep those things in for, for that long, the same tube? It depends on the clinical situation, and if they if they need chronic access. Um, the, it's probably better not to change a tube unless you reach a point where you need to change it than to change it on a routine basis. And these are for vascular access? This is for vascular access. So basically, in an IV, you have that second kind of catheter that goes through your arm. What's that called? PIC line. And what's that stand for, PIC? Peripherally inserted central catheter. Meaning that it goes in peripherally, it goes in the arm, but the catheter actually winds up going into the central venous system. How long do you leave that in place for? I, I tend to leave those in for maybe a month. Um, people have left them in for, for multiple months. I've, I've heard of people leaving them in for up to six months. So if you have to, uh, if you have to need, if you need something longer, longer term therapy, say chemotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, you use what, the Hickman, Hickman catheter, or the port. one of the subcutaneous ports. Mm -hmm. um, the, these catheters that you leave in place, for example, if you're draining an abscess, do you leave a catheter in place to drain the abscess? Yes. And if you have, uh, I know that, you know, for people who have a, and need access to their kidneys, for example, mm -hmm. a tube goes in through the skin to drain the kidney as well. Yep. You guys put those things in. How long do those stay in place? Well, it depends. Some people leave, leave them indefinitely. And in those cases, we do change them on a routine basis. How usually, often do you have to change those? Yeah, usually about every two to four months. Okay. So it lasts, a, again, fairly long time. Yeah. And it's easy to change. You can do without anesthesia, and it's easy access. Uh, I had this one patient who would come in. He... Uh, he had he had a problem where he had no egress from his kidneys at all so he had these tubes in uh, continuously he would come in and he had a little video poker game before it was on cell phones and he would play his video poker game while we uh, changed the tubes and he'd say thank you very much and then uh, we'd walk right out how so does that how does that happen where somebody has a, an obstructed kidney for example and that requires percutaneous drainage especially if it's both sides well you know the, the, the three biggest causes of something like that, the first one would be some type of growth. So there would be uh, cancer either of the ureter, which is the tube that drains the kidney, cancer of the bladder, which is the, the organ that receives the urine, or something else in what we call the retroperitoneal space where the, the tube runs down, usually some lymph nodes or something like that. But something that actually grows around the tube that drains the kidney can cause that tube to become obstructed and then the urine backs up into the kidney. Secondly, it would be something like, um, that would be physical, like a stone. Um, and stones are developed sometimes in, in certain individuals in the kidneys. They break off, they fall down the ureter, and uh, usually you can treat the stone, but sometimes the scarring that occurs because the stone has been in that ureter for so long can actually make the ureter impassable. Um, and then the third thing we, we actually see, fortunately not that often, is something that was done through um, a, a surgery where there's actually been some trauma to the ureter um, as a result of some other type of operation that, that was uh, being done for something else. Unfortunately, the ureter got, image, uh, got injured, excuse me, and um, when it heals, it scars down permanently, so we can't get past it. Now, the bread and butter things that you do, you, mm -hmm. you, know, you talked about drainage, you talked about uh, venous access. Mm -hmm. um, other procedures that you say, you know, would, again, are the majority of the things that you guys are involved in? Well, the third, Probably the biggest uh, ca general category would be biopsies. Um, basically, in the past, if someone had some abnormal uh, lesion or growth or abnormality, uh, they would have to have an operation, and a surgeon would go in and take out a large quantity of tissue. But what we can do is using various radiology imaging, whether it be ultrasound or CT, um, direct a needle directly into the area that we're concerned about, take out a small sample of tissue, give it to the guys with microscopes, and then they can figure out what the underlying pathology is. Now, how do you do this? What, when you do these, these kind of procedures, again, mm -hmm. your bread and butter, what modalities are you using? How do you image the, the tissues? How do you image the systems that you're working on? Um, well, for a lot of the procedures that we do, we actually use ultrasound, which has uh, no radiation. Um, we can actually see what we're, and, and every time we do anything, we're always watching what we're doing while we're doing it, but not directly. We're using the radiology imaging to see the tip of our needle, the tip of our tube, um, uh, and basically, 
we watch it to make sure that we go into the right collection, to make sure we go into the right blood vessel or whatever it is we're trying to do. So again, ultrasonography, um, no radiation exposure, or minimal as you use, you'll use a combination of ultrasound and, and x-ray exposure. Right, we use x-ray exposure or, or fluoroscopy, which is live x-ray. Um, and then sometimes we use CAT scan to guide now, us. For obvious reasons, people are quite concerned about x-ray exposure more now as people become more aware of, of uh, the risks and benefits. Uh, fluoroscopy, high dose exposure, low dose exposure? Actually, fluoroscopy is probably about the lowest dose exposure you can get. Uh, to take an actual hard copy x-ray image um, requires more radiation than to look at a fluoroscopic image. Um, with today's modern equipment, though, the amount of radiation needed for that um, is, is significantly less. Back in the old days when you had the old film plates where you actually had to, to expose a, a piece of film, now we have these digital detectors where it takes very little radiation to actually uh, get the, the image to appear. Now this has to be a benefit for you, too. I mean, you're exposed to this every day. Oh, yeah. How do you protect yourself against radiation exposure? Oh, uh, you wear lead. I wear a lead jacket that weighs about 15 pounds all the time. Hands, eyes, do you do? You wear lead uh, impregnated uh, lenses on your glasses. Um, there's really not a whole lot you can do for the hands, but uh, they tend to be kind of radio uh, resistant. So. <laughs> now, I, I can, you know, my own personal experience with interventional radiology actually began uh, even when I was still a medical student back mm -hmm. in, in the 80s uh, when uh, there was a colleague of mine uh, by the name of uh, Dr. Sal Sclafani, mm -hmm. one of the pioneers. And I remember watching Dr. Sclafani retrie retrieve a bullet out of a man's heart. I mean, it, we were at Kings County at the time, and that was <laughs> the, what we used to call the real deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Things have evolved, but I understand that you've had similar experiences, that this was how you got into the field yourself. You start off in, as uh, interested in surgery. You, you trained at, at Maryland and right. at Johns Hopkins, so right when I was a bit. At, when I was at Maryland, they have the shock trauma center there, which uh, has a lot of trauma, and I was actually um, on a pathway to, be, to do surgery. And we had a patient where the person was shot in the, in the neck, and the bullet actually got into the carotid artery and began to migrate up into the brain. And um, what they did was they actually retrieve the bullet from the groin and got the bullet out of the brain, improved the blood flow to the brain, and, and had to do a little bit of an operation to get the bullet out of the groin. Um, but they were able to get that vessel. And that procedure was actually based on uh, uh, Sal's uh, paper. And I started reading some of his documents, uh, some of his papers, along with another guy, um, Anthony uh, Scalia who ultimately wound up to become, I think he's still the director of shock trauma in Maryland. You were attracted by what I used to consider the magic of that procedure. I mean, to retrieve that bullet, what would have had to have been done if, if you didn't have access to, to interventional radiology? Well, the guy with the bullet going up into his brain, it would have been major skull-based surgery dealing with the carotid artery. It would have been, he probably would have suffered some form of brain damage. Well, it's, uh, it's incredible. Now, you, you're, you're doing a, a ton of things that are really exciting. Uh, I know you do a lot of work with uh, women and mm -hmm. and and fertility uh, problems. How do you do that? You know, what what did you replace, and what are you actually doing? Um, well, when it comes to fertility, we're doing some procedures that have always or that have tra traditionally been done over time, um, but our techniques are a little gentler, a little easier. Um, one of the common things we do is a hysterosalpingogram where basically we put a small tube into the cervix and inject dye into the endometrial cavity um, to see if the endometrial cavity has any abnormalities and to see if the fallopian tubes are open. Um, right. And we do that in radiology because we use fluoroscopy to verify that. Um, but we can also inject um, saline, which is a saltwater solution, into the endometrial cavity and at the same time do sonography, do an ultrasound, to see if there are any endometrial abnormalities such as polyps um, or any other endometrial lesions. Now, obstetricians um, and gynecologists do a similar procedure, but they don't use radiology. How do they do it? Well, for the hysterosalpingogram, they often do it in conjunction with radiology. Um, for the hysterosonogram, they often will have their own uh, ultrasound people there. Um, but we can do some things um, such as uh, fallopian tube recanalizations, where we can take a small tube and go into the um, fallopian tubes themselves and try to get them open. Or if a woman desires not to have any more children, we can actually put little coils into the fallopian tubes. So as birth tubes. control. As birth so control. I mean, these are surgical procedures. Uh, what, but what's nice is that we can do it with uh, minimal anesthesia because we don't have to actually look inside the uterus. Um, we can actually just use the x-rays to see what we're doing. So it's not like a tubal ligation. Right. 
that requires a laparoscopic uh, approach and general anesthesia. Right. Now, likewise, uh, a lot of women suffer from fibroids, um, which cause you know very heavy bleeding, sometimes leading to emergencies uh, because they can develop a, a severe anemia. Um, they have a lot of pain with their menses, and in the past, the only options were really hysterectomy or myomectomy, where they take out individual fibroids, but not necessarily the ones that are causing the problems, and they may leave some behind. We have a procedure now called uterine fibroid embolization, where we can go into a blood vessel at the top of the leg, direct a small tube called a catheter to the blood vessels that provide to the uterus, and inject some tiny particles that preferentially go to the fibroids, leaving the normal uterine tissue behind, um, and that basically treats every fibroid, no matter what their size, all at once. And uh, greater than 90% of women get very significant pain relief. Do they have um, single vessels that go into these fibroids that you can occlude, or uh, multiple vessels that you have to occlude? Usually we just go into the uterine artery, which supplies the entire uterus. But the fibroids are so vascular and so blood avid that they tend to fill before the normal uterine tissue. Mm. So we're monitoring this with fluoroscopy as we inject our particles. Once we see the fibroids are, are filled, we stop and we leave the normal uterine tissue behind. So because of your ability to monitor it, you're not injuring the uterus itself. Right. Now you do a lot of that. You do a lot of vascular occlusion procedures. Mm -hmm. uh, again, in, in my field as a urologist, I've seen occlusion of large uh, renal tumors mm -hmm. and the major vessels that feed into the tumors. Yep. Uh, and what else do you do? I, things like aneurysms. You guys take care of aneurysms in the head or, or in other parts of the body where you have bleeding, abnormal vascular, uh, supply that bleeds in the intestines or uh, in the stomach? Well, the, you mentioned renal tumors. You know, renal tumors just don't stay in the kidneys. Sometimes they'll go out to the bones. Um, and uh, an orthopedic surgeon may want to take out that tumor because the bone is compromised and it's impending fracture or it already has fractured. Um, and for them to do that surgery, there's a lot of bleeding involved, obviously, because these are very vascular tumors. So we can actually go in and embolize the tumor prior to the surgery so that when they take out the, the, the tumor, it's a lot less bleeding. Likewise, in the head, meningiomas um, will actually embolize meningiomas prior to the neurosurgeon taking out the meningioma, and that um, really saves on a lot of potential so blood loss. So you do a, a first step to, m to diminish the bleeding during the procedure itself. Exactly. <coughs> Again, as a urologist, we see uh, an entity called a varicocele, a, mm -hmm. a collection of uh, well, almost a bag of worms of large veins that collect in, usually on the left side in the, uh, in the scrotum involving the testicle that can be associated with discomfort, you know, pain and, and infertility. Uh, I understand that there's a female equivalent of this as well that's often missed. Right. Well, in both males and females, especially on the left side, the gonadal vein drains into the left renal vein, and all the veins in the body have valves in them in order to make sure the blood goes in the correct direction. If the valves go bad, that can lead to conditions such as varicoceles, um, where the vein, where the blood essentially is backed up. It's essentially like a um, varicose vein of the leg. It's the same thing happens in the scrotum. In women, it can happen in the pelvis. And in women, it uh, causes um, significant pelvic pain, discomfort, swelling. Sometimes you can actually have varices or, or, or varicoid veins of the uh, pelvic region. Now, I understand um, that this is not very obvious. No, but usually to the woman, it's, it's very real. And they can feel this significant um, discomfort. Uh, they feel a lot of uh, kind of a congested feeling. And in fact, the condition is called pelvic congestion syndrome. And we can actually take care of that by going into uh, the vein that drains either it be the scrotum or uh, drains the, 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 the pelvis on that one side, typically the left. And because the vein that's bad, that has the bad valves, we can occlude that vein and uh, basically break that cycle of abnormal pressure and abnormal volume in the pelvis. And you can have relief of discomfort literally overnight. Yes, definitely. Now, I understand that this presents women who have this <coughs> will often present as uh, uh, something as simple as discomfort riding a bicycle mm -hmm. and certainly discomfort with sexual activity. Oh, yes. How does a woman know she's got this and how does she alert her doctor that it might be a problem and to go to the next step to let them know that this might be an excellent uh, procedure for uh, interventional radiologists? Well, I mean, you mentioned some of the, the typical symptoms. Uh, you know, pain with, uh, with intercourse is certainly one of the presenting symptoms. Um, they notice that it's, it's very uncomfortable for them to sit for prolonged periods of time. Sometimes uh, they'll notice that there's a change in their uh, anatomy there where things are becoming swollen um, or if they have visible veins. Um, and it can be very uncomfortable even to walk. Um, and they should can have literally varicose veins of the labia. Yes. <coughs> and they should bring it to the attention of their um, OBGYN. How common a problem is that? 
Um, according to, well, it depends on the literature you read. Unfortunately, it's very underdiagnosed. So the actual incidence, people don't even really know um, because a lot of people don't realize that, uh, that they have the problem. It's under-recognized. And in the past, there wasn't a whole lot you could do about it. So they felt like, why bring it to anyone's attention? Um, but they say 20 to 30 percent of women actually wow. have, uh, up, uh, up to that, um, some type of venous abnormality. Likewise, uh, varicose veins in the legs are often caused by abnormal valves in the veins. And if there's um, an abnormal valve system in the veins, we can do an ultrasound um, to take a look and determine whether that's present. And if it is, we can use a laser treatment to actually destroy the vein that's causing the problems um, without having to take the vein out. So this, you actually pass a laser into the vein and can occlude the vessels by literally uh, burning them with the, with the laser fiber. Right. And that really helps. <coughs> I mean, we do it for the medical reason that congested blood in the foot can actually cause significant problems. You can actually lose toes. You get a wet gangrene situation. Um, so it's a real medical condition there. Um, but aesthetically, the women's varicose veins uh, improve significantly. So that's always a nice side benefit. Now there's another, there's another procedure that you guys do that also has very dramatic effects mm -hmm. <coughs> that can of, often be an occult problem, a you know, hidden problem for people, which is you know, collapse of vertebrae that we see people on steroids, people who are, as they get older, from osteoporosis. Uh, what are you guys doing for that? Um, well, in, in patients that have uh, vertebral body uh, fractures, and I, I'm specifically not using the word compression because often the people will develop this back pain before the vertebral body actually loses height. You can have internal bony derangement, um, and we usually get an MR on someone who has back pain, and if you see uh, edema within the bone, what we can do is we can inject, uh, a, it's, it's essentially a bone cement into the vertebral body which acts as an internal cast. It helps stabilize and strengthen that vertebral body, takes away their discomfort. So that swelling that you see, that edema, <coughs> will show up on an imaging study. Yes. And again, the presentation may just be back pain. Yes. Now we see that as people get older, they get that curvature of their spine. Mm -hmm. That's from this, that's from these collapsed vertebrae? As the vertebral bodies uh, <coughs> collapse, uh, eventually, they'll, 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 over time, with enough vertebral bodies collapsing, you'll start to curve over somewhat. Now you can't reverse that once that's happened. That's there's, there's very limited uh, amount of reversal you can try to achieve. Um, the, the process of vertebroplasty can actually improve the collapse a little bit. And sometimes the collapse is uh, in much as the person is actually splinting a little bit. They're actually mm -hmm. trying to stabilize their back. So when you take away their pain, they can stand up a little bit straighter and feel a lot better. Now um, when you have the initial presentation, uh, again, how does a person know that they should be getting an MRI at the back? Is the pain that severe? It's typically not minor pain. This is the real deal. Typically, it's significant pain. And what's nice about these procedures is they come in, uh, they're absolutely miserable. They can barely walk. We can barely get them to lie on the table for the procedure. By the time we're done with the procedure, their, their pain is gone, and they're feeling great, and they want to go out and go dancing, um, which is really nice. And again, who's most at risk for this? Who should be aware of this, you know, the problem and make sure that they can inform their doctor when they have it. Well, as so you get older, everyone develops some form of bone loss. Um, it's more pronounced in women. It's more pronounced in people who have a history of smoking. Um, in younger people, it tends to be people who are on steroids for some reason or another. Um, uh, there's some metabolic conditions that can predispose uh, to this condition. Um, but especially, you know, if you have uh, it's typically acute onset, meaning that it happens immediately. You can pinpoint the time or the event uh, when it occurred, um, back pain um, in a person. And the, the traditional patient is the older um, Northern European uh, woman with a history of smoking. Uh, they're the ones who tend to get it most often. So you are pretty much cover everything. <laughs> There's not really a specialty well, that doesn't have, you know, that, that intervention of your kind doesn't have some significant advantage. We have to know something about everyone else's field in order to give them the, uh, the feedback that they're looking for when they are trying to diagnose a patient. Um, likewise, as having a background in radiology, when we come up with these different procedures, um, we really need to address different problems that are, you know, needs that are unmet, where we come up with a more creative way of uh, taking care of something. Yeah, I love the fact that you, you, know, you cover everything from you know, fertility to oncology to, you know, major trauma, it's, uh, it's, it's an exciting field. Of, uh, of your own experiences, what would you say are the, the most gratifying? Um, 
the, I really like doing the petiberplasties because I, I love it when a patient gets off the table and they feel immediate relief um, of their discomfort. Um, uh, we do a lot of uh, oncologic therapy um, where we can actually treat tumors that are growing in people and when they see that tumor regressing, uh, that's really a great feeling also. Yeah. So. That's right. That's a, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. You've had the, the, the one disadvantage for you personally is that you're working in a lot of hospitals. Yeah. You cover a pretty broad range, but that also means that you're available for the entire county. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I assume you're not working by, I hope you're not working by yourself. No. And you have a, a number of people. You're working with the, uh, the uh, White Plains Radiology Group, right? Right. And I have a team of uh, five interventional radiologists that I use to, to cover the different hospitals. Um, and we do kind of switch around a little bit to the different hospitals. So if something comes up, if a patient uh, contacts me and they want a procedure done, not only can I do the procedure, but I can ask them, where would you prefer to have it done? Because we could offer services anywhere from Northern Westchester and Mount Kisco all the way down to St. Barnabas in the Bronx. Now, do they contact you directly, or do they contact you through their physician? How does that work? Um, some patients will contact me directly. They'll find me um, online or, or through a Google search. Um, um, but often uh, the different hospitals will contact the department or their physicians will know me through, uh, through interactions with the different hospitals. Well, so. you know, it's, it's been enlightening. I hope that we've got enough information out to people so they know how to take advantage of your services. Mm -hmm. uh, the key, obviously, is to uh, not suffer in silence. If you believe that you have a problem that's uh, amenable to interventional radiology, you should certainly contact your physician. Uh, this is especially true for those chronic pains and acute pains that we see with, with back problems and uh, obviously infertility and the others. But a lot of these other things are, it's the physician themselves that know that they require your services. Yeah. And they'll usually call you either from the hospital. If it seems like the majority of things, the big three that, uh, things that you do, those are people who are already hospitalized and they're, they're known to require intervention. Right. But I think the, the uh, procedures that you're doing for spinal pain um, and, and, of course, for, well, I guess infertility, too, that would be possibly through the gynecologist. They probably wouldn't contact you. But mm -hmm. the spinal pain, for sure. Anything else specifically that you think they sh people should be contacting you directly about? Um, well, I mean, you, it, it's always nice to have a creative approach to things. Um, so if, uh, sometimes the answer that I have to a question that someone, you know, gives me isn't necessarily a procedure that I'm personally going to do. Um, but because I know or I have to know a lot about what everyone else is doing, I can, also, I can often point someone in the right direction if need be. Dr. Mark Hammett, thank you very much for, for being with us today. Uh, thank you for watching. I hope that you've gotten enough information to apply to your personal care or the care of those you love. Uh, see you next show.